once you start thinking critically about what your eyes are telling you, you might start to think critically about what your gut is telling you or what your government is telling you. Jim is, is well known, at least in the, in the G4G community already. Uh, he's a math professor as, at UMass Lowell. Um, you can find more about him on our webpage with many, many links and many, many interesting videos, uh, which are linked to. And I will hand over to, to you, Jim. Without further ado, Jim Prop. Thank you, Tiago. I don't know which is stranger the way mathematicians often embrace ideas that at first glance seem nonsensical or the way we mathematicians often hold obvious truths at arm's length, scrutinizing them with a skeptical eye and asking, how do we really know it's true? Here's one such obvious truth. You can't pack more than four disks of diameter one into a two by two square if the disks are forbidden to overlap. There's just enough room for four disks if we place them at the corners of the square, but then there's no room for a fifth disk. So what could possibly be the point of asking for a proof of something that's so obvious? Before I answer this, let's extend the problem. What if we try to pack disks of diameter one into a two by three rectangle? It's obvious we can't fit in more than six. What if we try to pack disks of diameter one into a two by four rectangle? It's obvious we can't fit in more than eight. Okay, so let's take a big leap and look at a two by n rectangle where n is a thousand, say. Isn't it obvious that you can't pack in more than 2,000 disks? I mean, you just start packing those disks in from left to right, shoving each new pair of disks into the rectangle as far to the left as they'll go until the rectangle is full and there's no room for any more disks. That's the best you can do, right? Isn't it true? Isn't it obvious that it's true? I'm hoping you're thinking, yes, it's obvious because then what I'm about to show you will surprise you and maybe teach you something not just about disks, but about knowledge. Because the thing I tried to badger you into believing to be obvious is actually false. You can pack more than 2000 disks of diameter one into that two by 1000 rectangle. Here's a packing that I learned about from Dick, Dick Hess at a gathering for Gardner. If you pack the disks this way, repeating this pattern of six disks. Eventually the packing becomes more efficient than the obvious packing. You can check my blog for details. So if our goal is not to be fooled, we might wanna be careful about saying, oh, that's obvious. So let's back off from n equals a thousand to look at the two by eight rectangle. Is there a way to pack more than 16 disks of diameter one into this rectangle? I don't think so, but I don't know a proof either. And that's a little bit uncomfortable, but discomfort is not always a bad thing. Sometimes discomfort is where new ideas come from. I don't know how to handle the two by n problem when n is eight or bigger, but I do know how to handle it when n is seven or smaller. And I could show you a proof using a cute trick called the pigeonhole principle, which Gardner wrote about in a few of his mathematical games columns. But this is a talk about feeling uncomfortable. And my goal is not to relieve tension, but to celebrate it. You can read my blog if you wanna know how a rigorous proof might go. I try to get students to think critically about what makes them certain of their knowledge. I want them to have moments where they think to themselves, yes, I believe this, but should I believe it? One of my mentors was Ronald Graham to whose memory I'm dedicating this talk. He invited me to my first gathering for Gardner back in the 1990s. He also did a lot of work on packing problems of various kinds. For instance, he looked at efficient packing of disks in a square and disks in a triangle, even disks in a disk. One of his favorite packing problems was packing squares in a square. Martin Gardner wrote about this in his column in 1979. When a square has side length m, within a whole number, you can pack one by one squares into it with no wasted space. But when the side length of the big square isn't a whole number, then there's going to be a certain amount of wasted area. 
What if the side of the big square is n plus a half? The obvious way of packing in one by one squares gives wasted area roughly equal to 2n, which grows linearly with n. Ron Graham and Paul Erdős found a way to tilt some of the squares and pack them in so that the wasted area grows much more slowly, like n to the power of 7 elevenths, which is about 0.636. Later, Ron and his collaborator and wife, Fan Chung, found a more efficient packing in which the wasted area grows even more slowly, like n to the power of 3 fifths. If you can reduce that exponent even further, or if you can prove that nobody can, Chung will pay you $250. I think math can be a great training ground for the skeptical mind because there are so many opportunities for us to believe things and then disbelieve them. This habit of mind of believing and then disbelieving is more important nowadays than ever. George Orwell feared totalitarian governments demanding our adherence to creeds, but I think just as big a threat to our complex 21st century civilization comes from credulity. Intellectual complacency can be just as effective in suppressing inquiry as a boot in the face. That's why if I were an evil despot, even before I outlawed mathematics, and of course, all the works of Martin Gardner, I'd outlaw books of optical illusions. The journey to freedom from the tyranny of your own mind begins when you discover that two line segments can have the exact same length, even if at first glance, one of them looks longer. If I were an evil despot, I'd nip that sort of discovery in the bud, because once you start thinking critically about what your eyes are telling you, you might start to think critically about what your gut is telling you or what your government is telling you. I'll end by quoting the mathematician and former teacher Teller of Penn and Teller, who came to G4G in the past and I hope will visit again. He said, magic doesn't wash over you like a gentle reassuring lullaby. In magic, what you see comes into conflict with what you know, and that discomfort creates a kind of energy and spark that is extremely exciting. That level of participation that magic brings from you by making you uncomfortable is a very good thing. When I go outside at night and look up at the stars, the feeling that I get is not comfort. The feeling that I get is a kind of delicious discomfort at knowing that there is so much out there that I do not understand, and the joy in recognizing that there is enormous mystery, which is not a comfortable thing. This, I think, is the principal gift of education. That's all I got. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jim. If people want to ask questions, you are able to either raise your hand or just leave a question in the chat. I have a wonderful new proof that one plus one plus one plus one, four ones, is equal to five. You take four squares and put them together to form a square, then you have five squares. Oh, I like that. Jim, my question was, at what n can you pack in more than 2n? It's an interesting question whether we'll ever know. The, the point being that the amount of effort that you might have to devote to figure out the answer might exceed the interest of this problem to the mathematical community. Dick Hess worked out the current record bound and let's see, I'm gonna have to- 167, right? Oh, fantastic. No, I did not know that. In, in the general question of whether it's worth the effort, it might not be worth the effort to the community at large, but there might be somebody who wants to find out. That's true. Something that's bothered me for a while is that Martin Gardner did all this great work that's not finding its way into classrooms. And for a while, there were these film strips, uh, the paradox box, but I don't think classroom teachers have easy ways of taking what Gardner did and applying it in their classrooms. And so if someone seriously wanted to enhance Gardner's legacy, on mathematical education, finding a way to bring his work into the classroom might be, you know, a huge benefit. The paradoxes that are talked about here is kind of a way the opposite of what you've been doing, Jim. It's not an argument that's false that produces something that's wrong. It's an argument that's correct that produces something that you didn't want to believe. Huh. That's true. Uh -huh. That's sort of it's part of the same package. Neil Kalkin is also pointing out that one of the goals of the Julia Robertson Mass Festival is to bring these things into the classroom. And with this, we end our session. And I cannot phrase and thank you enough, Jim. And yeah. have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.